Big round of applause for Mr. Jeff King. Okay. Um, I studied physics at MIT. I did electrical engineering for about eight years. I've had quite a bit of practical engineering experience. When I first saw the collapses, I was absolutely convinced that they were not spontaneous. Uh, one of the first things that I did was to speak with one of my patients who is a retired Army Corps of Engineers fellow who's done a lot of demolition and construction, uh, showed him some of the public source videos that are available of it, and he immediately pointed out that there were squibs, which represent little puffs of smoke essentially coming out of the buildings initially, uh, which were clearly a sign of controlled demolition. He had no opinions beyond that, but he said without, without doubt that it was a controlled demolition. That sort of set me on the path of continuing to examine it and trying to gather as much evidence as I could. Uh, and the, the question I pose, what don't we know and why don't we know it, is, is sort of addressing the fact that at this point we still do not really have uh, a meaningful explanation for what happened to the, the buildings. We, we have had several studies at this point which I will go into as to trying to determine a, a plausible scenario for the collapse. As of this point, none of them have presented us with anything that I think could be reasonably called a, a convincing and detailed account of why the collapse has occurred. Uh, and the question that's been addressed previously, the enormous destruction of physical evidence. Uh, as Chris was saying, the site was, was scrubbed very thoroughly. Uh, out of the entire mass of the buildings that were destroyed, uh, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, who are now doing the ongoing investigation, managed to save about 200, 240 pieces out of the entire building. Uh, all of the rest of it was, was basically recycled. Uh, you know, the obvious question is what, what does it mean that there was a controlled demolition? At the simplest level, it means that someone had a lot of access to the buildings over a long enough period of time to set this up. It implies, as many other things have tonight, that the people who had effective control of the site had an interest in having it scrubbed and making sure that uh, no information was available, uh, that a, a forensic reconstruction couldn't be done. Even in much smaller catastrophes, we typically will reconstruct things as, as, as completely as possible. Uh, for example, TWA Flight 800 was construct was re you know pieces were dredged off the, the bottom of the sea. Uh, a, a complete reconstruction was done to allow a, a detailed analysis. In this case, the exact opposite was done. The first report that was really issued on this was issued by FEMA in collaboration with the American Society of Civil Engineers. There was basically a volunteer team from ASCE that had very limited access to the site. A lot of the pieces that they were able to retrieve were retrieved by going to landfills and trying to find interesting pieces before they were disposed of. The initial FEMA report uh, basically acknowledged that the kerosene would have burned off very quickly. What wasn't destroyed in the initial fireball would have been consumed fairly rapidly and would have only really served as an ignition for the rest of the material. And the second point being that the, the fuel here really was strictly office contents. If you think of a modern office with copying machines, computers, uh, and as has been previously mentioned, the, the smoke, particularly from building two just before it collapsed was, was very black looking. Uh, this is generally an indication of an inefficient fire in which there's not enough oxygen for the amount of fuel. These types of fires typically burn very cool. They, they are not hot flames like blowtorches. Uh, the cores themselves, basically, uh, if you've seen diagrams of the building, there's a large central rectangle in each of the towers that contained 47 columns. And these columns basically were the, the, the primary structural support of the building. They were given the role of supporting the, the whole gravitational load of the building. Uh, since they were so strong, it would have been reasonable to think that they would have withstood, at least to some extent, the collapse. But in fact, as we see after the buildings collapsed, there was basically only little stubs of these things standing up a floor or two above the ground level. Uh, 
The cores did not have much in them that would burn. The cores basically were dedicated to things like elevator shafts, utility shafts, stairways. Uh, so you have drywall material, you have a little bit of carpeting, you don't really have any inflammable material in the core itself. The core was specifically designed so it could not function as a chimney. They did not want, in the case of a fire, for the fire to be able to travel through the elevators or for air to come in through the elevators. So they were designed with what this uh, architect, Aaron Swirsky, I believe it was, referred to as a hermetically sealed system. There were fire shutters that were designed to close off the core in the event of, of an event like this. And those, as far as we know, functioned properly, which means that there was a very limited amount of oxygen available. Okay, as far as the issue of what failed and how, uh, some of the initial suggestions, and these showed up in the NOVA documentary, which is a good example of what I like to call proof by computer animation. Uh, Thomas Egar, who was a material scientist but not a structural engineer who became a, a spokesman for these documentaries, uh, indicated that the floors had somehow failed, that the trusses supporting the floors had failed. Uh, this was the, the theory that was put forward actually in the initial FEMA report. Uh, Subsequently, there have been basically complete contradictions of that. Uh, Jim Hoffman has done quite a bit of research which is available on the web concerning the, the problems with this idea that the floors would have simply fallen. There was a study done by Weidlinger Associates. The chief engineer there was Mathis Levy, who's a very well-known authority on building collapses. He specifically disavowed the idea of pancaking or collapsing of the floors. And the most recent official report we have on this, which is from National Institutes of Standards and Technology, NIST, rejected the idea that floor collapse was part of it. Uh, and so as, as a result, we have basically no sequential model at this point. What NIST has suggested is that there was some kind of simultaneous collapse of the cores, but they have not attempted to give any kind of, of uh, modeling as to whether those cores could have in fact been destroyed by the fires in the way that they claim. Unfortunately, the material that would have allowed a detailed fire analysis, the actual physical evidence, is all gone. Uh, one of the most significant things to, to my thinking uh, uh, that indicates that this could not have been the sort of collapse that we are told it was is the presence of the dust clouds. Uh, and as you've seen in the pictures, and I'm sure all of us have, have uh, seen probably more than we would like, uh, there were very, very large clouds of very thick dust that enveloped the area that crossed the river that made it almost all the way to New Jersey from the pictures that I've seen. Uh, this type of flow is something that we are familiar with in physics. It occurs in only two situations that we know of naturally. Uh, one is in volcanic eruptions where a large amount of material is suddenly exploded into the air and basically forms small particles. Uh, the other situation is something called turbidity currents. These occur along the edges of the continental shelves where mud or sediment will slump, become suspended in water. And the, the common thread is that you have large amounts of a, a dense material that is suspended very quickly in a fluid thereby creating another denser fluid, which is in effect the dust cloud, and that fluid can achieve considerable velocities. Uh, the problem with creating this sort of uh, slurry of fine particles is that there really is no mechanism that has been proposed. We have concrete floors with carpeting or flooring over them. We have furniture. We have floors basically that are coming together in a collapse but the concrete is basically protected under these layers. Uh, early in the collapse, in the very first moments, we see these thick clouds being ejected at very high speed. They're clearly dense because they flow downward and become part of this large overall pyroclastic flow. Uh, what we're basically being told is that the concrete sort of jumped up into midair, exploded itself, and then was ejected as the floors came together. Not a very plausible mechanism, but I, I have yet to hear of, of anything else proposed to explain it. Uh, from quite a few people on the scene, we've been told that the powder uh, it represented most of the concrete, that the amount of intact macroscopic chunks of concrete on the scene were, were negligible, that basically everything was reduced to powder. 
And incidentally, we also know that other things besides concrete were reduced to powder. We know that contents of computers, exotic metals from computer chips, these sorts of things were, were also identified in the dust.